Hello, friends. I'm Kathy Fay, Executive Director of the Boston Early Music Festival, or BENTH, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to this very special pre-concert talk, preparatory to our upcoming concert featuring the extraordinary vocal ensemble Stili Antico on Friday, February 28th at St. Paul Church in Harvard Square, Cambridge, Massachusetts. It is my honor to introduce our four guests, including three members of Stili Antico, soprano Rebecca Hickey, soprano Kate Ashby, and bass Will Dawes, as well as Edward Jones, university organist and choir master at the Memorial Church at Harvard University. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Thank you. Rebecca, Kate, and Will, it's hard to believe, but our upcoming concert marks Stili Antico's 12th performance on the Banff concert stage since your memorable North American debut at our June 20, 2009 Boston Early Music Festival. We're looking so forward to this program entitled England's Nightingale, Music of William Byrd, honoring the 400th anniversary of the death of William Byrd one of the most extraordinary composers England has ever produced. And because we simply can't get enough of you, I'm so pleased to remind the audience that you will be back in Boston in just a few weeks to perform at our thrilling June 2023 festival themed to celebration of women with a program appropriately titled Breaking the Habit, Music for and by Renaissance Women. That concert takes place on Friday night, June 9th at Emanuel Church in Boston. Before I turn the microphone over to our moderator, Ed Jones, for those wishing to attend our Friday evening, April 28th performance by Stili Antico, tickets are still available and can be purchased online by visiting the BEMF website at bemf.org or by calling the BEMF office at 617-661-1812. For those unwilling or unable to attend our in-person performance on April 28th, virtual tickets are available as well. Our virtual presentation premieres on Friday, May 12th, and will be available for a two week period from Friday, May 12th through Friday, May 26th. So with that, I will now disappear from the screen and turn the discussion over to the four of you. My thanks again. Thank you so much, Kathy, and hello to our BEMF audience. Um, it is such a joy to be here once again with three members of the uh, incredible ensemble Stile Antico, um, who we are so blessed to be having with us twice uh, upcoming in Boston, as Kathy mentioned. Um, we have uh, Kate, Becky, and Will with us today. Um, William Byrd, as Kathy just mentioned, died 400 years ago, actually on the 4th of July, which in this country is usually punctuated with the marches of John Philip Sousa. But I think in Britain, people will be singing Byrd all the time. This is a remarkable composer, really one of England's greatest geniuses, um, and such a multifaceted composer in terms of composing in all the available genres of the time, expanding them, taking models from his continental counterparts and his English forebears, and taking them in very new directions in some ways and keeping things the same in other ways. Uh, probably most famously a, a Catholic in a very Protestant England at the time when being a Catholic was uh, not only illegal, but had very many problematic things associated with it in, in terms of sedition and everything. Um, he was a courtier, as well as being a very shrewd businessman and really um, going for the professional side of music making in terms of publishing his own music, making money from it, or trying to make money from it. Um, and he lived a very long life and published a great deal. So we have a lot of comparisons to make um, between his various styles. Um, your program is so beautifully crafted into four different sections um, of Bird's music. And I wonder if we should um, begin just by uh, delineating that a little bit and maybe having each of you talk about some of the different sections that you're doing. Absolutely. So, um, the, as you said, the, uh, the the whole program show aims to show the many different sides of Bird's uh, work through his very long life, and we've divided it into these different sections to show uh, his loyalty to Queen Elizabeth, but at the same time his loyalty to his Catholic faith. So, in the first half, we have um, music that was written for 
Queen Elizabeth's Chapel and music that would um, have been uh, conforming to the expectations of musicians of the time. And then a set that contrasts with that with music that was written for the kind of recusant Catholic community with some hidden coded messages to those people. So that makes up the, the bulk of the first half of the concert. And then in the second half, we look at his later years and also his legacy. So that we look at the um, the latter 20 years or so of his life where he retired down to the countryside in Essex. He decided he'd had enough of the intrigue of court life and wanted a, a quiet life down in the country and just so happened to live around the corner from a, a Catholic gentleman. I'm sure that wasn't a coincidence and ended up uh, composing a lot of music for services that were held in his country home. So uh, he wasn't really retiring um, in the true sense of uh, giving up composing music, but he was leaving London life behind. Um, so this, this is music from his later years. And then we followed that with a set of music by uh, uh, composers that were inspired by Bird, and he was he was well known as a teacher, um, an inspiration and a direct uh, inspiration as a teacher as well. Yeah, and we can't we cannot resist good puns. Um, as Kathy Dawsey mentioned, we our, our women program is called Breaking the Habit, as it features music by nuns. So we always like to find slightly punning little titles. So for each of this these four sections that Kate talked about. There's a little sort of bird connected pun. Um, so the first one is about bird being a good egg and being very loyal to the queen um, and doing what he's supposed to be doing. Um, so and maybe as we talk through the programme, we can explain the puns if they need explaining. Which they Some of them may not translate into American, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so the first section, a good egg, is all about bird being the loyal subject. And uh, he was a gentleman of the, of the Chapel Royal at this particular time. So the three pieces that we'll sing um, in this section are all in English. Um, and it starts off with a uh, bird setting of O Lord, make thy servant Elizabeth, which is uh, a retexting of Psalm 21. The king shall rejoice in thy strength, O Lord. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's very beautiful uh, in six parts, quite unusual, sort of soprano, two altos, two tenors and, and a bass part. Um, and then we follow that with Sing Joyfully, uh, which uh, was supposedly um, performed uh, at uh, James the First's first daughter's christening, um, which therefore you might think, well, and a law of the God of Jacob um, going being sung all the way through that, there's a sort of very Jacobean sort of touch to it as well. Uh, and then the final piece in this first section, uh, the Nunc Dimittis from his wonderful great service. Um, it's extraordinary. I didn't quite know where he got all the altos from, but I mean, it's <laughs> it's called uh, two, two choirs of soprano, alto, alto, uh, tenor bass, um, so four alto parts in all, uh, and he does really come up with some wonderful um, colours all the way through uh, to, to really vary the scoring, and it's not thick ten part mm. um, polyphony all the way through at all. I have yeah. a question for my colleagues on that actually, and do you know why it's called the Great Service? Is it just because it's in lots of parts, and did Bird call it that? Do we know? Um, I, it was not, it wasn't published in his lifetime, so I don't think I think the Great Service was definitely something that he would have been it would have been later performers who would have called it the Great Service. Um, definitely wasn't published. I think the thought is that it was probably written around the same time as the masses, um, because that's where the kind of the latest uh, the, the earliest part books that we have that have any part it, it's, it exists in lots of different sets. So you get sort of in New York Minster there might be the ten and one the bass one and um, soprano too, and that's all they've got left. So they've people have yeah. had to piece it together. It was it was actually pieced together around 1923. Was around the first it was the first time they managed to piece it back together. So it was around the 400 uh, 300th anniversary of uh, Bird's death 100 years ago, um, and so it was a really big part of those celebrations 100 years ago. Yeah, it's a, it's a great um, setting, isn't it? And I, I heard a recording today of, um, you know, with sack butts and call it sort of, um, or maybe just the sack butts actually accompanying the voices. And it just, it, it is definitely great. It's, it's very grand. Yeah. Yeah. But we're only doing the, the longevities from it, which is a lot more um, intimate, isn't it? It's very beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I say to my, our, our singers when we do that piece that there were generations of choral singers that never actually got to do this piece because no one had actually done the digging around to piece it all yes. together. So incredibly fortunate nowadays to be able to do that. And I guess the tradition of the great services do, does go back and then obviously forward from Bird of, the, of these masterpieces, um, as we think of them, that may well have been, as you said, um, Becky, accompanied um, not only by some sort of 
organ in the background, but actually by a lot of different instruments, which is fascinating. Um, and I think, as you mentioned, Will, I think I love the fact that you are punning each section because Bird clearly enjoyed his puns, as you said about the Jacobean, um, and also the hidden meanings that are associated, not quite puns, but just the things that are hidden in the texts mainly of the of the uh, the Latin works, um, which were for, as we've said, Bird became a kind of mouthpiece for uh, the recusant Catholic community in a very brazen way, actually, an incredibly brave way, and clearly had the favour of Queen Elizabeth, um, who looked after him, seemingly, uh, when everyone else was not able to do that. Um, and then you you preface the whole programme or the, or the good egg section with um, Emendamus and Melius, which opens the 1575 Cantiones, and then close with Laud the Great Laudibus, which opens one of the other, I think the 1592, uh, 1591 ones. Um, can someone just talk about those bookends? Uh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So Emendamus and Melius, we wanted a, a little sort of opening piece just to give a sort of way into the programme. And as you said, it was the first piece that, that was published uh, in the 1575 uh, Cantiones Sacra, Sacra Collection that Bird published with his teacher, Thomas Tallis. Um, at the time, Talis was a generation older and much better known. And this was this was a collection that was to kind of really make Bird's mark. It was to really kind of set his stall out as a composer. And it was a piece that he chose to put at the beginning of his section of, of music in that publication. It's a it's a penitential work. It's quite homophonic, um, relatively unusually for Bird, uh, but it has some moments of real beauty in it. And it's one of these wonderful pieces that Bird really seems to excel in. I mean, he excelled in everything he wrote, but he, he makes these perfect little miniatures where there's not a single note that's wasted. And he manages to pack so much into a piece that lasts about a minute and a half. Mm. And then we close with Laudibus and Sanctus, which is one of my favourite pieces to sing. It's um, it's a sort of riot, really. It's just a, a really joyful piece. It's a reworking of Psalm 150. Um, and it's all about music, using musical instruments to praise God. So it's, it's just full on happy all the way through. And it's really kind of madrigalian. He really brings in a lot of the kind of almost Italian at word painting that, that you don't get a lot of in English music at that time. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the great gems, isn't it, with all the onomatopoeia that's going on at the same time and, and all that stuff, brilliantly Italian. It's, and interesting that, but especially in something like Emendamus, as you say, it's mainly homophonic, bringing in the sort of the Reformation ideal of having music that was actually very easily comprehensible to an audience or a congregation um but brings that into a latin work which is sort of interesting and bird does this throughout his career doesn't he it's not that um and people shouldn't be thinking this this program is sequential in terms of um dates you know jumping around he he didn't suddenly decide to just only write latin music for clandestine services he was going back and forth as you said at the beginning between his duties at the court and then the various um communities that he was serving outside of that absolutely i think the only time you really in his works hear a sort of different style developing is when he moves down to Essex and he has this kind of I think his later works that are published there in the Graduaria books that were written in 1605 they do have a slightly different style it's a style that really doesn't get replicated anywhere else it's really kind of Bird's unique style but the but you're right that the earlier stuff the things that are published in Cantonus Sacre the things that were published that were sung in the court the great service this was all stuff that was happening at the same time when he wrote the masses the four-part mass we sing the Arnish Day in that and that was again 1590s around the same time he was composing in so many different styles that mass uses a lot of harmonic language and melodic language that, that almost sounds like taverner it almost sounds like a gen two generations earlier really yeah um, I mean, especially that opening the, the opening duet of the Arnie's day could be from yeah. two generations earlier and he yeah. takes that and especially comparing it to something like mn damus and melius which is completely completely different it's remarkable yeah yeah, I was going to pick up on something that Will said earlier about the about the scoring of the great service, which is remarkable in itself. Um, how, as a 12 person ensemble, do you decide who's going to do what when you're singing sort of eight part music or even in that case, 10 part music? Will, as somebody who often has to sing a part of this. Do you have to <laughs> jump up, you ever jump up to counter tenor occasionally? Or... Uh, well, I mean, I have. Uh, <laughs> I do have actually. <laughs> As, as um on a recording with Stevie singing counter tenor. Um uh but anyway, enough about that. Um, some of the uh some of the higher tenors uh rove up to some of the lower alto parts. Um and that works quite well. Um but I think we just take it in terms. It's it's sort of a, a metaphor for, for how the group really works. Yeah. You know, I mean eight always... parts is yeah, particularly tricky, isn't it? But we tend to do it 
with just eight of us rather than having too many spare people on the part. I see. Okay, great. So you just that, do that stuff one on a part. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. One, one of the difficult things about Bird is that there are often parts that have extraordinarily big ranges. So you often get the middle voice in a five voice texture might have a two octave range and it's a sort of very high tenor or a very low alto and, it's, and sometimes we end up just mixing we have an alto and a tenor on a part so that they can sort of take the strain at various different ends of that um so that i i think it's almost more an issue with bird than it is almost, almost any other composer that you get these parts that have really big ranges and completely yeah, think, yeah. sorry no i was just gonna say yeah in the four part mass you, the, the alto and the tenor parts are really close in range mm -hmm. and I'm, luckily actually our altos are pretty proficient mm -hmm. on the, the lower register so so if they're yeah. offered any help by a tenor, they'll say, we don't need help, thank you. So. <laughs> it's a good question what the original kind of intended scoring was for that four-part mass, mm -hmm. because it yeah. does seem to feel, it doesn't feel very appropriate for an SATB ensemble. I mean, we love mm -hmm. singing it and we think we do it quite well, but I mean, if you were to drop it down a third and do it altos, tenors, baritones and basses, it might, because the, the lowest bass note is, is not low. I mean, even I can sing yeah, it. It's quite a high bass part, actually, yeah. Um, and there's there's editions which which take uh, the singers way up to very high notes for obviously Etta Shendit in Chelem in the credo, um, mm. but uh, yeah I mean because the essay the, the five part mass definitely feels like it involves soprano alto two tenor parts and a bass part mm. and three voice mass could be soprano alto tenor or alto tenor barrett or alto tenor bass but the four part mass is just a bit bit more of a curiosity I think. So it was published with, in high clef, so there's actually no bass clef involved at all. So when you look at it on the page in the original publication, it's higher than we sing it. But yeah. that seems it somehow mm. seems unlikely not to have any bass well, I mean, the tenor part would be stratospheric all the way through. So uh, unless there was no, unless it was soprano, mean, alto and tenor. Tenor, yeah. 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 But, Difficult yeah. to know who was singing these underground masses, so yeah. It could have been written for quite specific people. I right, mean, exactly. Just who, they might have who we have there. Individual yeah, singers. There'd definitely be women, wouldn't there? So yes, there oh, yeah, there's a lot of evidence. Mm. Yeah. And certainly the, the four-part mass, I mean, like all of his masses, it feels like he's trying to get through mass in a bit of a hurry, just in case there's a knock at the door. Um, and there's there's hardly any melismatic writing at all, apart from the only the Sanctus in, in the, in the four-part mass. But notably, I think in the in the Donna Nobis Parchem of, of, of the four part mass of the Arnie's Day, um, you get this, it's not long melismas, but um, mm. in, in the final section, it's really sort of cascading chains of suspensions and really quite poignant dissonance, um, well controlled. And it does really feel like he's asking for, for peace for the Catholics at that particular point. Yeah. I mean, those wonderful scrunches. And that, that actually segues quite nicely onto the section of some of the works that have, as many musicologists like to point out, sort of hidden meanings of sort of the Israel exile and Babylon and everything like that. Does someone want to talk about some of those works from the um, from the two later sets of cantianos? Yeah, so this is the, the sort of second quarter of our concert, which we've subtitled The Caged Bird, which kind of gives reference to the fact that Bird was at court, he was a Catholic, um, but when when he joined the the, gen, the chapel royal, he had to sign a, a, a an allegiance to the queen and accepting her as you know in charge of him, as it were. Um, and in a way, he was almost risking excommunication himself uh, from the Catholic Church, um, as they declared that she had been excommunicated two years earlier. So, in a way, he was taking a risk. Um, but I think he served the Queen gladly, didn't he? He definitely had a lot of respect for her um, musically and in many other ways. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the Cantian is Sacre publications of 1589 and 1591. Um, the first set was, were all five part, I think I'm right in saying. Um, and many of them, yeah, as you say, they did indeed use texts that re referred to the plight of the Jews having left um, Israel and how there were parallels felt by the recusant Catholics that they'd been almost forced to sort of leave their Catholic faith um, and that they you know they had to rely on God to see them through and they were constantly appealing to him just as the Israelites did to, to guide them and to um, see them through this really difficult time. Um, so Vide Domine, which is the first piece we sang, it's actually not entirely clear, clear where the text comes from, it's anonymous, but it, it there's definitely sort of um, 
feeling a feeling of the lamentations or um, parts of Isaiah. Um, and the text, um, I can tell you the text is, um, Behold, O Lord, our affliction and is an, an evil time, do not forsake us. Um, how much more than when Jerusalem, the chosen city, was laid waste, is our hearts rejo rejoicing turned to mourning and our joy to bitterness. So, you know, there's a lot of identifying with, the, you know, the sheer desolation that the Greek and Catholics felt in England at the time. Um, and then Nea Ascaris Domine, which in my opinion is one of the, his absolute best works. Um, a similar sort of idea, and it goes round and round the idea of Jerusalem being deserted, and it, it's really incredibly moving. Mm. Um, um, and then in the, in the middle of that set, um, we also sing the Hake Dies, which on the face of it is a joyful Easter motet. Uh, but in fact, that very same text was quoted by um, Campion, Edmund Campion, at his trial, um, just before he was hung, drawn and quartered. So it's sort of quite, um, well, very subversive text in a way. And I'm sure then, that, I mean, this happened, you know, 10 years, I mean, yeah, sorry, it was 1581 that Campion was, was killed and the publication was 1591. And we don't know how soon after that Bird wrote the piece, but it's very interesting just to think of that um, in conjunction with the, with the text also being a, a kind of this is the day that the Lord has made. So it's yeah, on the face of it, it's not necessarily all, all that it seemed. Yeah, it's I mean, th they're three amazing works and it'd be incredible to hear them. Of course, one of the great things about your concert is you are doing it in one of the great Catholic churches of America with one of the great big acoustics. Not what what Bird might have imagined he would want his music performed yeah. in, but actually nothing, of course, that he ever got to perform it in at that time. Um, should we move on to the country nest? Um, so the retirement to Bird. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the um, 20 years at the end of his life where he'd moved down to Essex and moved uh, away from London uh, life and was looking for a, a quiet life serving his patron, Lord Peter, in um, Ingotson Hall, which still exists today, actually. It's an amazing Tudor mansion that is still lived in by the same family. And there's priest holes. There. There's a couple of priest holes you can see where they would have hidden the priests when uh, the authorities came looking. So uh, we know that the, and Bird makes it very clear that the music he wrote during that time mm -hmm. was written for secret services held in uh, Lord Peter's house. The first piece we sing um, for the country nest where Bird has retired down to Essex is uh, called Retire My Soul, which is uh, published in the final publication he, he brought out in 1611, right at the end of his life. Uh, and it's all about sort of considering what you've achieved in your old age and um, what things might be uh, worth remembering and what things turn out to be just, you know, youthful folly. And uh, it's very poignant, actually. It's a really, really beautiful piece and uh, one that isn't that well known. Um, I remember Sally Dunkley, who has sung uh, for many, many years with the Talis Scholars, came to our concert in Oxford and she said, I've never, I've never heard that piece before. And I thought, wow, we found something that even Sally Dunkley hasn't heard. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful uh, piece of bird that deserves to be known better. Uh, and then by contrast, the next piece in the programme is very well known, which is the Arve Verum Corpus, which comes from uh, Graduelia, the publication of Graduelio. And Graduelio were two volumes that he brought out uh, during his time in Essex, which were very explicitly music for the Catholic service. So they would have companion pieces really for the masses that he brought out. So they were pieces that were that set the propers for the feast days through the year. So through the church year, the most important high days and holidays, um, feasts like the Assumption and uh, Christmas, obviously, Epiphany and things like that, they, the mass would include propers that would be set to music. And this is music that was performed in the household by whoever was musically literate and free and willing and able to do it and bird would have been part of that so the, the next four pieces all come from that collection Arve Verum corpus is if anyone if you know any piece by bird it's probably that one it's uh, <laughs> it's a simple four part piece uh, which gets performed a lot um in the uk certainly and i imagine in the states as well beautiful uh, eucharistic um little motet and then uh, after that we do three more pieces from the gradualia um there's a really lively uh, Factus est repente setting of a, a proper for Pentecost. Um, and by contrast, a beautiful little piece, Optimum Partum Elegy, which is another, another little gem that we didn't really know before we programmed this uh, concert. And we've all sort of come to really love it, actually. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece uh, that was, it's part of the Assumption Proper. So a Marian feast uh, in the middle of August, and um, definitely a feast that the Protestants would not be seen anywhere near. <laughs> so it's very much a Catholic feast. <laughs> 
and it's this lovely little text. It's it's actually it talks about Mary, but it's not the Virgin Mary. It's actually Mary, the sister of Martha, and it's the story from the Bible where um, Martha uh, gets very cross that that her sister isn't doing any helping with the housework, and um, and Jesus says, no, no, but she's chosen to do something more important. She's chosen the more important thing to do. And um, this is actually a text that was quite often associated with Catholics who decided to flee to the continent and that they'd chosen the better part. They'd chosen the, the better choice, I guess, um, is, is, was the idea. So it, again, it sort of chimes with the, the life of the Catholics abroad. I, think the, the, I love the music from Bird's later years and the Graduate because you get a sense of the kind of peace he probably found moving out of London life. Um, and and you, he sets he so often sets these alleluias and they're always so beautiful and all, there's always a sort of sense of being a little bit more at peace with himself after all this anguished Catholic uh, recusant music that he published while he was in London in the Cantione Sacre, which is equally beautiful and amazing in a different way, but just to to kind of feel like maybe in his later years he found something that he was a little bit more at peace with. I think. Mm, I love that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, part, as we were talking about earlier, I mean, part one of the reasons that <clears throat> I think the Ave Verum is so often performed is that it is it, it is very easily doable with a four part choir, with an SATB choir, and that is one of the problems, as we mentioned earlier, with trying to do so much of this music because the scoring, the tessituras, the sort of transpositions that you use, and that does lead me onto a question of. Um, how do you decide? Do you decide as a group what editions you use? Do you make your own editions? Uh, a little bit of a mixture. So um, the bird, a lot of our bird editions are by David Fraser, who's done some really wonderful editions for Choral Public Domain Library. They're just freely available for everybody. He's also been very helpful about transposing stuff in the past. Um, generally with bird, we've used his editions. Sometimes we make our own editions. Sometimes we ask uh, somebody to make editions for us. We've got a couple of people who are really good at making editions for us. But in terms of in terms of finding what scoring and what pitch suits us, we just go for whatever is going to be most practical. Mm. Um, we certainly don't seek any kind of authenticity with the score because, I, as we were talking about before, I don't think pitch was an absolute concept in that time anyway. So um, we would just do whatever is going to suit our forces. Mm. Talking about Catholics who fled to the continent, some of uh, Bird's pupils are featured on this, or students or colleagues. I mean, the Chapel Royal was such a fertile ground for people everyone to sort of be there together. Um, but Peter Phillips did flee to the continent and you're doing his wonderful eight part Ecce Vici Leo um, and then enclosed by works by Thomas Morley and the great Welsh composer Thomas Tompkins. Um, <laughs> does someone want to talk about those? Um, yeah, I think Morley um, supposedly worked very closely with Bird and is so closely in fact that he seems to have stolen parts of his music for um, the piece that we're singing this concert the Domine Dominus Noster which was written but Tom Morley was only I think 18 or so or 19 when he wrote it and um, at the very end of it he quotes verbatim five bars of one of Bird's pieces um, the Libera Me Domine um, but it's, it's, it's very much a homage isn't it he's not sort of stealing but he, he writes this whole, whole piece very much in the style of you know Bird's 1575 um, Cantione's pieces, and then there's his five bars at the end of it, which is pure bird, which is, I suppose, that's the best way Molly, was, Molly was infamous for taking other composers' well, he works. he was, actually, yes, that's true. Off as well. um, Roger Labaravi in, in Gemma Meo, for example. I mean, it's the same piece, but somehow it's yeah. got Morley's at the top where Roger wrote it. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. He was quite an interesting character, though, Morley, wasn't he? Because he was accused of being a spy as well. And <laughs> various things. Well, the people thought maybe he was a Catholic, but then he kept denouncing yeah. other Catholics, which is quite, exactly. a sneaky, quite a sneaky plan. Yeah. <laughs> and then the Phillips, which is just an absolute gem. Yeah, it's really fun. It's a double choir. So this is one of these examples. It's an eight part. So we've just got eight of us singing it, yeah. um, kind of with four on each side. I mean, it's quite late. It's 16... 13 or something um yeah 16 13 and he'd been on the continent a good 30 years by then so he'd really absorbed the continental style and this, this sounds very italian and it's sort of you know with ideas being fired from one choir to the other um so that's quite fun. It's almost a bit of light relief in the middle isn't it <laughs> i think it's almost a, a sort of a little glimpse into what was happening on the continent because what bird was doing by that point was so different to what was happening in you know but, but when he was down in essex and publishing things like retire my soul Monteverdi was writing his Vespers and it's just a completely different sound world, sound world. Yeah. So Phillips left England at quite a young age and sort of left that English style behind him, really. 
And that will sound glorious in the Italian at church. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and then the final piece in that set is a really lovely little madrigal, I think, by Tomkins called Too Much I Once Lamented. Um, and it's, um, in fact, it does use a sort of bird technique, which is sort of rising and falling semitones at the beginning. Um, but I think it's absolutely gorgeous. And it's got this very sort of languid, sad fa-la-la at the end, which is interesting, not a thing that Bird ever set. I don't he never put fa-la-las in his madrigals. Um, but as it, and that's sung by what is it, six, five or six parts? Just five, five of us, yeah. Five parts, and so and five, it was actually so it's quite intimate. And I think in the publication it's dedicated to Bird. That that particular madrigal was is, uh, right. dedicated to. And, and he called him his much reverent, reverent master, didn't he? So that's where that yeah. little title comes from. Yeah, and we've got the little pun, under his wing. So these are obviously <laughs> composers that Bird took under his wing. <laughs> and then you end with the great Laudibus. Fantastic. I mean, it's interesting because obviously be just before Bird came on, to, well, not just before, but before uh, the Reformation, and then, of course, afterwards, the Civil War, the Commonwealth, the Restoration. And so there's this great irony that Bird being sort of a wonderful revered in his lifetime by everyone including the queen and then also posthumously but then his music the, the irony to me is that a lot it's really actually his anglican music that in some ways survives the restoration stays in the repertoire in some of the cathedrals and some places and then of course has the great resurgence um sort of right at the beginning of the 20th century and then with wonderful groups like yourselves keep going but the, there always seems to me so much to dive into that the average kind of cathedral choir doesn't do for many reasons much of them practical actually in terms of scoring that we've been talking about so it's terrific that you're giving us such an amazing cross-section of this incredible fascinating character is there anything you want to add in, into closing i think we've covered most things not really i think just to say it's, it's it's a lovely excuse this year to be able to celebrate basically one of our favorite composers and spend the whole year singing his music so it's actually been quite a joy <laughs> so far yeah. ed you just touched on this but i mean in a way um because we are a 12 voice ensemble with three soft three altos three tenors and three basses there's a certain amount of repertoire that we really specialize in for birds and we're presenting that and it's quite a wide ranging program mm -hmm. uh with sacred secular english latin etc but there's so much of Bird's music which we're simply not able to present for, for scoring reasons um, and things like that. I'm thinking of great pieces like the nine part uh, Domine Chris Habitavit, um, which is A, A, T, T, bar, bar, and then B, 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 three bass parts, all chuntering around on sort of bottom E's and stuff like that. Mm. Um, uh, Ad Dominum Cum Tribulara, which is uh, an eight part piece, which is, is rarely done but absolutely it's, it's fantastic. So what I'd say is that if, if any of this sort of sparks your interest, it's worth even sort of digging down and found, finding more works by Bird, which, which just, there are great works out there that just aren't done enough because there is so much good Bird mm. that people always focus on sort of the best bits. Um, but even the not best bits are pretty fantastic. So it's worth it. Absolutely. And just, I mean, even his keyboard works, which was a different program, but, um, you know, Moscolese love them. Glenn Gould loved them. I mean, there's absolute gems in there and the consort songs and everything. It's a, it's a remarkable repertoire. And we're so happy, uh, just to close, um, that you will be bringing it to Boston, to St. Paul Church, Harvard Square, uh, next Friday, or actually when this go out, goes out this Friday, sorry, we have pre-recorded this, uh, this Friday, uh, April the 28th, at 8 p.m. and you can buy tickets uh, from bemf.org. So it just leaves me to thank so much our guests today, Becky, Kate, and Will from Stile Antico, and see you at the concert. Safe travels. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye.